Hi, this is Jack from Anatomy Zone, and in this tutorial, we're going to be talking about the shoulder girdle. So the shoulder girdle consists of the scapula at the back and the clavicle at the front. And together with the proximal part of the humerus, it makes up the bony framework of the shoulder. Now the shoulder girdle is also referred to as the pectoral girdle, so you can use either of those terms. But in this tutorial, we're going to be talking about some of those aspects of the shoulder girdle and concentrating on the clavicle and the scapula. So the clavicle is this long bone here, which connects the scapula at one end and the sternum at the other. Medially, it articulates with a part of your sternum called the manubrium to form the sternoclavicular joint. And laterally, it articulates with the scapula at the acromion process to form the acromioclavicular joint. Now, if we just look at the clavicle from a superior view, you can see that it has a curved shape to it, which is sort of a backwards S shape to the bone. And this curve, you'll notice, is convex medially just before it articulates with the manubrium of the sternum. So there are a couple of landmarks on the clavicle to note and they are on the underside of it. So if we just now look at the underside of the clavicle, on the lateral side you have a bump that's called the conoid tubercle which you can see here. And the role of that is to provide an attachment for the conoid ligament. And just in front of that bump is a line called the trapezoid line, which is for the attachment of the trapezoid ligament. And those two ligaments together form a complex, which is called the coracoclavicular ligament, whose role is to stabilize the clavicle to the scapula. And finally, on the undersurface of the clavicle is a groove along its length, which is called the subclavian groove, and that houses the subclavius muscle, which in one sense helps to stabilize the shoulder during movement, but perhaps more importantly, it protects the large blood vessels and nerves which supply your arm underneath it if you break your clavicle. And seeing as your clavicle is really commonly fractured in trauma, it's pretty important. So now moving on to the scapula. So the scapula or wing bone is this flat bone that sits on your back and it serves as an attachment for many muscles. And we have an anterior surface and a posterior surface to it. So the anterior surface of the scapula is also called the costal surface as it lies against the ribs forming a physiological joint that's called the scapulothoracic joint. And note that I'm saying physiological joint because it's not a true anatomical joint because the movement here is happening between the scapula and the muscles that are in front of it and not two bones that are lined by cartilage. Now if we just rotate round you can now look at the posterior part of the scapula and we've got two angles here, a superior angle at the top and an inferior angle here at the bottom. We also have three borders, a medial border, a lateral border, and a superior border. And the scapula also has three processes. So you've got this area, which is the spine of the scapula, the spinous process. You've got the acromion process, which is this process here that articulates with the clavicle. And then on the front side, you've got the coracoid process, which is this little hook shaped bone that extends out from the scapula. And it provides the attachment for the conoid and trapezoid ligaments, which form this complex that we mentioned previously called the coracoclavicular ligament. But that coracoid process also provides attachment for the pectoralis minor muscle, the short head of biceps, and the coracobrachialis muscles. And it's also worth pointing out here that there is a little notch here that's called the suprascapular notch, which is on the top of the scapula, and it's just medial to this coracoid process. And the role of it is to allow the passage of the suprascapular nerve, which passes below it, to supply a couple of muscles on the back of your scapula. 
We also have four fossas, which means, so fossa means a depressed area, and on the posterior part of the scapula, the spine of the scapula that we've mentioned before separates the scapula to two halves. So above the spine is the supraspinous fossa, and below the spine is the infraspinous fossa. And you can see how their names relate to where they are in relation to the spine of the scapula. So the supraspinous fossa provides attachment for the supraspinatus muscle, and the infraspinous fossa contains the infraspinatus muscle, and both of these are rotator cuff muscles. And now rotating round to the front, um, so on the front or the underneath of the scapula is the subscapular fossa. And this is filled by the subscapularis muscle. And again, this is another one of the rotator cuff muscles. So finally, on the lateral portion of the scapula is the glenoid fossa. So this fossa articulates with the humerus to form the glenohumeral joint, or what's colloquially known as the shoulder joint. The glenoid fossa has two tubercles on it a superior and inferior tubercle. So the supraglenoid tubercle, as it's called, is where the long head of bicep attaches, and the infraglenoid tubercle is where the long head of triceps attaches. So that's everything that we wanted to go through on the shoulder girdle or pectoral girdle. We hope you've enjoyed watching this tutorial, and if you have, give us a like and make sure you subscribe to Anatomy Zone.